All right. I think we have a good number of attendees, so I think we'll get started here. Uh, welcome to our session on driving to the best engineering decisions. My name is Amanda Bly. I'm a principal research scientist at a priori, and I'm joined by my colleague, Patrick Hartnett, who will be managing your questions during our Q&A at the end of the presentation. So with that, uh, let's begin. There we are. Now, we know that engineers have to make a lot of decisions as they work their way through the product development process. But the data inputs, the calculations, and other information, that can be delayed. And that can really influence how long it takes for them to reach a confidence result on any decision that they're trying to make. So what we're going to discuss today is how to use the cost of manufacturing as a metric and, and where we can get that not a priori to help drive better decisions faster and earlier in the product development process. During this meeting, I want you to consider how this mindset will help your engineers be more confident in the decisions they make or you as an engineer, how you can be more confident and how that's going to influence your next projects. With the review of this technique, we will be helping you to better enable decisions around manufacturing with your designs and to increase your confidence as well as decrease the time that it takes to get to a confident place. As a quick interjection, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Amanda Bly. I am a principal research scientist here at a priori. Uh, my background is in mechanical and manufacturing engineering, focusing on helping engineers reach good decisions and providing tools in order to do so. I had uh, four years at the beginning of my career where I worked for Hasbro, focusing on Nerf and Super Soaker toy products. And I've been with a priori for the last 13 years, uh, focusing primarily in the professional services organization and also in helping to understand what our customers are doing next and enabling those capabilities. I've also taught design for manufacturing in both an academic and professional setting and really uh, am passionate about helping, helping engineers reach good decisions. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about what engineering decision-making is made up of. What does that process actually look like? So we can think about what engineers do as a process where we work through time to increase confidence. And there's a set of steps that engineers take, whether these end up being linear or uh, recursive. The first step is really to define a problem, figure out what are you trying to solve? What is the goal of the work that you're doing? Next step is to identify constraints. What are the things that help to define the space of the problem and where you're going to need to look for your answers. Then we engineers take and complete the work. So actually do the calculations or run the simulations in order to understand where they need to get to, make a decision and then document that decision. So this really represents the, again, the uh, these key steps. They may not happen linearly, and indeed in most engineering these days, they don't. They're going to be recursive. You may get to the point where you're making a decision and realize that you missed a constraint, or that uh, as you're completing the work, you actually have to go back and redefine the problem to some extent. So with that in mind though, let's take a little bit more of a detailed look into uh, these individual steps and what some examples as to what that might look like. So first off, let's take a look at how we might define the problem and identify constraints. Now, types of problems that we might be facing from an engineering perspective, uh, we may be doing a new design to help improve performance, or we may have a mass target to hit on our product. So uh, in order to reduce fuel consumption, we may be changing a material for a number of different reasons, or we have a new, new technology that we need to incorporate incorporate into our product, either to uh, be the best in class or to meet some other standards. Now, when we think about the constraints that we might have on these problems, we have things like time. How long is it take us, going to take us to actually get this result out? Do we have market forces that we have to meet? When I was in the toy industry, we always had to hit dates 
uh, for uh, to make sure that we had shipments ready for Christmas or for Easter or for back to school. We, we can look at mass as a constraint. So it may be a problem that we're actually facing, but we may have, but we may have another problem that we're trying to look at with mass as a finalized, as a final constraint. We have, may have a size, maybe in our design, we can't get bigger than a certain envelope. We may have environmental conditions that we need to uh, can take into consideration relative to corrosion or emissions, or perhaps uh, uh, UV and other types of uh, things that our product may see in the environment that it operates in. Uh, we may have technology constraints. So maybe we have to abide by some rules regarding uh, from the FCC or uh, the FAA or uh, other regulatory bodies, or perhaps we have, we, we're working on the limits of a technology. And so we can, we know what our chipset capabilities are. And so we can only overclock to a certain amount. And of course, something that's deep to the heart of a priori, cost might be a constraint. And of course, QA, QA. So our quality assurance, looking at safety, looking at reliability, looking at other aspects of that overall product that we need to hit. So that gives us an idea of the problems and the constraints. The next thing that we want to look at is how do we actually complete the work? Now, within the world of engineering, we do this with the help of tools. Now, tools could be as simple as paper and pencil or it could be the number one engineering application, Excel. Or we might sit down with some colleagues, uh, you know, in these days, probably through a Zoom meeting in order to discuss and uh, brainstorm some ways that we can actually solve the problem that we're looking at. We may use some digital tools. This might be FEA, FEA or a priori or any of a myriad of different uh, uh, software products that exist. We might call a supplier or we might phone an expert in our field as well. So we have all of these different types of tools that can help to support the decisions that we reach as we work our way through the product development process. So our next step though, is once we've done the work, once we've figured out what the numbers are, we need to make our decision. And at that point, we're balancing the results of our decision against the constraints that we have. And then once we come to something that meets as many of these as possible, we take and document that. And that may be in the form of a 2D drawing, that may be in the form of a 3D model, it might be a white paper, it might be some other documentation that exists within our PDM or our PLM system. So that gives us an idea of what an individual type of decision might look like, the types of things that we may do within it. But we can think of the overall process within engineering as walking through uh, walking through these decisions. So here we can see just you know, a cartoon example of what the development process might look like. We have a string of decisions that we're making as we march through the various stages of product development. And one thing to note is, of course, there's many of these uh, happening in tandem. Different decisions are coming together to, to form a uh, increase in confidence overall. And, but what we can notice here is a few different things that tend to happen within product development. One is you might discover something that actually decreases your confidence at some point. And so we can see this early on here in the conceptual design phase, where at some point we got some information that it didn't actually increase our confidence as we worked through the process, it decreased it. We learned something in doing the work that made us have to rethink something. Now, the other thing that we can notice here in these red triangles is the multiplicative effect of specialized tools. And uh, for those of you who've been in the industry for a long time, uh, you may recognize CAD as one of these types of tools. So whether you were here for the move from uh, 2D drawings, 2D pencil drawings to 2D uh, electronic drawings or from uh, 2D drawings to 3D CAD, you can recognize that as we move through time or as we adapt these new technologies or adopt these new technologies within our process, we're using a similar amount of time or maybe even less, but we're gaining much more confidence. Once we can start to see our designs in 3D, see how parts fit together, we have a much better idea of what the pro final product is going to look like and what that final product is going to do. Even more of an impact are tools like FEA. 
because what those tools now do is they eliminate uh, testing. And you can examine much more of the design space, many more options by using, the, using FEA capabilities a, instead of doing physical tests. And so we can see that represented here with this taller triangle that in the same amount of time, we're gaining more confidence in what that final product's performance is going to be. So let's add in one more while we're here. Let's add in design for manufacturing early on in the process, which is of course what we look what we like to look at from an a priori perspective. And our, we see cost as an as a metric for use in design for manufacture. So you can start to understand what is going to be the impact on that later on manufacturing very early in the process. So what I'm going to do is talk in a little bit more detail about the power of early DFM. What does that really provide you as we look at, look at it within the frame of uh, manufacturing decision-making? So let's take a quick look at uh, the design process as it has to do with manufacturing as the goal. So first off, a engineer may work through, may select a material, may uh, complete a design, they may select a manufacturing process and start to simulate, engage with the suppliers or the factory that they're working with. And from that, they're going to get a cost or uh, some sort of estimate that will, that will help them to decide how their design is moving forward. And then finally, that will be released to manufacturing for uh, final uh, manufacturing development. If life is perfect, if everything is going right, we're gonna do this once. And that's what we can see on the right is a representation of that decision or of that running through this process once. We go through the time, we have an increase in confidence. But the reality is, is that very often we're going to get some information back on that cost element. And we're, it's gonna be one of these situations where we end up losing confidence because we didn't think of something and the supplier comes back and says, well, actually we need to do this a little bit differently or it's gonna cost you quite a bit. And so maybe you need to go back and do some redesign. And unfortunately, this is something that unless we're very, very knowledgeable about manufacturing or can work really, really closely with the supplier, we may have to do this multiple times. And so we are gaining confidence. We are gaining a better understanding of how the fin final manufacturing is going to go and gaining much more confidence as we go through this uh, time after time, but we take more time uh, each time that we do this. So let's take a look at an example where we can see how uh, this type of um, idea would be applied within the realm of using data within the context or from a priori uh, within this decision-making format. So here we have our uh, working through, defining the problem, identifying constraints, completing the work, deciding and documenting. So in this case, our problem is going to be this mount that we see here. And our goal is to take and strengthen the, our problem is to strengthen this mount and allow it to support more material, uh, particularly through the uh, joint that we have up here on the top, this round joint. So we have a few constraints that we're going to work with. In this, we have the new load that we need to support. And then we also want to avoid a cost increase. So in order to complete the work, we're going to take and run, use our CAD system. We're going to use FEA in order to evaluate the new design. And of course, we'll take and run this through a priori in order to uh, really understand what that impact will be. Now, classically, we go through, complete that work, decide a document, but now with a priori, we can get more of that information early on. And we can do this by using things like the reports that a priori has. So we have a few different examples of the reports that are available, such as our tooling report, which gives a detailed tooling breakdown. It includes materials and labor costs and um, allows you to kind of compare two designs to each other based off of the cost of tooling. Uh, our process details gives a detailed cost breakdown for various for the process that you're looking at. And it gives you a summary of that input information. So you can dig down into the details on the design. And a comparison report, which can be very valuable, especially in this case, to start to understand how 
uh, what the results are from multiple designs and compare one against the other. So then you can identify where the differences are and figure out, uh, do you want to make this change? So let's take a look in a little bit of detail at a propo the proposed change to solve the problem that we have here. So here we have on the left design A and on the right design B, we can see design B has a additional uh, bit of material of webbing here in the middle in order to strengthen the overall support or strengthen the, this overall support. And so we can run this through a priori. Uh, and so we see that here where we can see design A on the left, design B on the right. And by looking at this comparison, we can see that the piece part cost has actually jumped quite a bit. We're going up about a dollar and 50 cents just for this small change. And so from the perspective of our engineer here in the blue circle, this is a much larger difference than they expected because they only added a small amount of material. And we can see that indeed uh, when we look at the material cost where we really only added three cents worth of material, but we have an increase in the part cost of $1.50. And we can see here, a lot of that has to do with our direct overhead cost where we're taking and seeing an increase of a dollar and 20 cents just right there. So the next step would be to dig into the details and really understand where is this cost increase coming from so that we can understand if we want to accept it or we want to uh, look at some additional changes. So uh, taking a look at another reporting view within a priori, we have our design A on the top, our original design, and then design B on the bottom we can start to understand a little bit more about why that overhead rate was impacted. And we see here that in design A, we're using an injection molding machine that is uh, 2000, kilo, uh, 2000 kilonewton clamp, clamp force and a direct overhead rate of just of about 15 and a half dollars per hour. And then in our design B, we have an injection molding machine of 3,500 3, 3, uh, kilonewton clamping force with a direct overhead rate of $22. So we can see quite an increase from one to the next. And so in digging into a little bit more detail, our, des our des design engineer here in the blue circle was able to identify that by, by making this small change, just the small addition of material in the middle, what that caused is the requirement for an additional side pull. So up at the top, since the slide can go all the way through, we just need to do the side pull from one side. This is a, a, within this injection molded part. In the bottom, we have a web in the middle, so we can't push the slide all the way through. And so therefore we need to have two side pulls, one on each side. And by doing that, what that did is that increased the size of the, the required size of the mold and that bumped our machine up. So we ended up needing to go to this larger clamp force machine because our mold was just that little bit bigger. So now the engineer needs to start thinking about, okay, what, what do I want to do here? Do I want to accept this change in cost? Now, one of my constraints was to avoid a cost increase, but perhaps this is acceptable. Perhaps uh, other changes that would uh, meet this same type of uh, result from a strength perspective would cause cost increases elsewhere in the design. Or perhaps um, there are some uh, other constraints around the material type or something like that that force this type of design in. But the other thing is that perhaps I need to sit down again with some of my engineering colleagues, understand the design more generally, what, what is the system that this is part of and start to see if there's other changes we might be able to make to avoid this large increase in cost. But what we're getting is we're getting this cost information as a metric, as a way for us to decide, do we want to make a, the design that, or do we want to have a design that forces this type of manufacturing uh, direction? So let's take a look now at what this does to our model of um, decision-making that we have within the context of manufacturing. So uh, we, you know, as we saw before, we see this in the shadow here, we have multiple times that we might need to go through the process. But now if we take and we add a priori at this design phase, now our, in our first phase, our first time through, we're going to see 
a decrease in time and an increase in confidence because we have more information. We know what may be coming when we start talking to our manufacturer. And we might we might not be able to make this through just in one go, but what we're going to find is that when we start talking to our manufacturer, we're not going to have that drop in confidence that we saw in our second go round with the, uh, with our, uh, without a priori. We're going to maintain a lot of that confidence and get to a high level of confidence very quickly because now we have the information in a priori. We have the ability to uh, you have some foresight as to what the supplier is going to say, what concerns they're going to have, so that we can um, take and address them, you know, while we're going through this process the first time, or anticipate the type of things that we may need to do in our second go around with the supplier. So that's really great. And, you know, the the cool thing about this is that just by adding that one tool into the process, we're able to take and to compress the time that it takes in order to make a decision and in order to work our way through the overall product development process. But now let's talk about what we can do by multi to further multiply the power of these tools. So now if we, we can increase confidence faster by overlapping the digital tools that we have. So here we can see an example of uh, taking and moving our uh, our digital tool sets, our specialized tools over each other. And we can see that takes and compresses the time further. And we can see we've opened up this additional time here. So maybe we can pull in our manufacturing time more. Maybe this gives us time to explore more options, uh, uh, identify different suppliers, or to um, hit those time to markets uh, targets that we have um, more directly and more confidently. So let's take a look at a couple of examples as to what this means. How can we overlap these tools? So first off is an example that probably a few of you have seen before, but uh, really exemplifies this ability to use multiple pieces of software simultaneously and the power that that brings. This was working with a customer of ours, uh, Cross Muffet Wegman, and what they were looking to do was to take and reduce the mass and the cost of this part uh, without taking and producing prototypes or getting quotes from suppliers. And so what they ended up doing is they did this manually. They operated a priori and their finite element software simultaneously. As they made a change in um, CAD to represent, uh, they ran it through their FEA tool and then they'd run it through uh, a priori. And they could use the feedback to inform changes that they'd make in the CAD and run those again and again. And what they were able to do was to, in weeks instead of months that it would normally take to make these practical examples and practical prototypes with the supplier, was they were able to save over two thirds of the cost of this part. Wow, that's like really dramatic, just by taking and combining these digital tools together in a manual usage. Again, they met their weight savings goal as well, and they could see a f about a five-year savings of just under half a million euros. Again, pretty dramatic savings just by taking and combining the information that you get from two pieces of software and kind of running them off of each other at the same time. Now, uh, many of you may be aware of the ability to automate a priori and to take and uh, consider how a priori are to automate a priori with other software. And so this is a project I've been working on for the last few years is to help it help customers take and embed a priori into design optimization workflows. And so here we can see an example of what that might look like where uh, in a product such as Mode Frontier from Asteco or uh, Dassault Systems Eyesight, uh, you can take and build up workflows of engineering tool sets so that as you're updating your CAD, as you're doing a parametric design optimization on your CAD tool uh, within your CAD, you can take and run that resulting CAD through your finite element analysis software. You can run that through a priori's bulk costing tool at the same time. And you can do hundreds, thousands of iterations in order to get to the best result. And so this really highlights a, uh, a more direct ability to explore much, much more of the design space than even you would in the previous example where you're doing that same type of, of overlapping in a manual manner. I also want to take and highlight uh, Cost Insight Generate. Uh, you heard a little bit about that in uh, Stan Croker's uh, 
the presentation earlier today, and you can hear even more about it in the presentation following this one from Tobias Tauber and uh, uh, Pat O'Brien, and they'll take you through uh, exactly how Cost Insight Generate works. But again, this is a situation where we're overlapping digital tools. We're taking an overlapping PLM with the data from a priori and how that that, that that can help to drive decisions earlier in the process and bring information in when the engineer is making the decision. So overall, and I'm sure this is a very familiar slide to many of you, uh, whether that be from the cost perspective or the simulation perspective, what we are trying to do with this is we're trying to take and have the opportunity to make decisions early on in that simulation innovation window, where we have an open design space, where our uh, life cycle cost determination hasn't been solidified very much, where we have more opportunities for cost reduction, we have more opportunities to actually change the design. And this gives us the power to uh, analyze more design options, faster time to market as we saw, because we can reduce that overall time by combining the capabilities of our digital tools. And, and then the great result here is that since we've gained that confidence, since we've gotten a higher confidence level, this gives us le less late stage churn as well, because we know what's gonna happen. We have the foresight, we have the information that will allow us to make really solid decisions now. And we won't need to revisit them in the same way later on. So I want to leave those of you who uh, are customers or soon to be some next steps to think about as how you can start to engage in this, how you can really use a priori as a decision tool within your engineering organizations. And so uh, let's take a quick look at some of those opportunities. So first off, uh, working with our CSMs and our expert services uh, consultants within our uh, customer success team, they can help you to start mapping your process and really understand what types of decisions are ripe for using cost as a metric. So does, are these design decisions, are these some sourcing decisions, and then how can that data get where it needs to go? Uh, additionally, they can help to, we can work with you to help identify reporting needs and making sure that you're getting the data that you need to drive to those best decisions within the engineering process. Uh, with Cost Insight Generate, we have the opportunity to automate that data creation. And again, Tobias and Pat will give you more on that in uh, the session following this one. And then, the, you know, the really dramatic thing, the way, the way that engineering is going, the future of how we're going to be making engineering decisions really has to do with integration and optimization. So taking and including cost as a factor in design optimization workflows throughout the uh, early on in the process when that design space is open and, uh, and within um, very specific uh, analysis as well. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. And I'd like to take a couple moments to respond to some of your questions. Uh, the Q&A panel is still open, so there's definitely time to answer your questions. Uh, Patrick, do we have any that came up? We do. We uh, actually have a question around tolerancing. So Ooh, how, does, how, does, how does Operary work in terms of understanding tolerancing and the impact to manufacturing cost? That's a fantastic question. And I actually recently did a presentation on this uh, with NAFEMS. Uh, where you can, within a priori, there's the capability to have tolerances uh, as uh, the semantic tolerances on the 3D model. And that data can get sucked into a priori and then evaluated as a, uh, uh, in order to determine which processes are suitable to make that particular, um, uh, you know, particular surface that you have. So, you know, in essence, what we can do is if you're tolerancing in 3D, we can understand those and, and bring those into a priori. That also can be automated uh, with, uh, based off of the different types of systems that you may be using. Great. Um, probably have time for one more question here. So what other types of software tools can further increase confidence in final product when used with cost? Yeah, great question. And so we talked here about uh, FEA and the ability to use different types of automation tool sets in order to, uh, you know, to, 
to take and to explore even more of the design space. Uh, so we need to, what we'd want to think about are what are some of the other constraints that we're looking at and what software tools are we using there? So this may be, um, you know, other types of simulation tools, CFD, uh, noise vibration and hardness tools. Uh, you may have some tools that uh, are looking at uh, data that's coming out of your manufacturing system. So perhaps some IIoT uh, from you know your industry 4.0 uh, to drop a few keywords. Uh, you know, using that information with it within a priori or within other tools to start to understand. You know, how do these types of uh, real time data impact what the cost could be? Great. Any others? Uh, we had one follow up to tolerancing. Sure. Any added support for inventor for tolerancing and thread? Oh, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer right offhand, but um, if you uh, drop me a line, I'd be happy to follow up on that directly for you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. That was that was a fantastic presentation. I really appreciate you taking us through that.